Hello, everybody. We're going to talk here about the various causes of respiratory infections, and this is very high yield for your exam. One of the things that we're going to talk about here is pneumonia. You can expect to get asked about this on your exam. This is also a classic, classic uh, vignette uh, or uh, game for CCS. All right, this is, this is really bread and butter medicine here. So uh, you'll want to pay attention. You'll want to know this cold. If you haven't uh, had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right-hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel. You'll get updates as I put more and more videos up and notifications and whatnot. All right, so we're going to talk about pneumonia, we'll talk about acute bronchitis, and we'll talk about the pulmonary abscess. We're not going to talk about tuberculosis here. That is certainly an important pulmonary infection, um, but it deserves its own talk, and I certainly give it one. Pneumonia is a respiratory infection that is basically just characterized by infection and inflammation of the parenchyma of the lung. It is the leading cause of infectious death in industrialized nations, and that is because there are certain populations that are very susceptible to pneumonia, particularly smokers and COPDers. It is classically classified as typical and atypical. That might not be very useful for you, uh, but it will be useful for you on the exam. So typical pneumonia presents with the classic symptoms as a triad of fever, cough, and sputum, increased sputum, I should say, and it commonly shows a lobar consolidation, which is why it's important to get your chest x-ray. Atypical pneumonia may have less distinct or no symptoms, particularly when we talk about something maybe like walking pneumonia, or it may have a chest x-ray that is out of proportion to the symptoms, or what you may see on chest x-ray, instead of a lobar consolidation, you may just see increased interstitial markings, but more generalized. Uh, pneumonia can also be classified as community-acquired pneumonia, which you'll often see abbreviated as CAP, or hospital-acquired pneumonia, or even ventilator-associated pneumonia. So fever, cough, and sputum are the classic triad of symptoms found in pulmonary infections, usually pneumonia. And the best initial step in management is going to depend on their presentation. So if they're short of breath, along with this fever, cough, and sputum, then you're going to give them oxygen, put them on oximetry, and then get the chest x-ray. Remember, we're always tending to the ABCs first. Okay, so if they're short of breath, if they're hypoxic, we have to deal with that first. Then we can deal with the pneumonia. If they're short of breath with signs of hypoxia, uh, so like blueness of the lips or something like that, cyanosis, we're going to do oxygen and oximetry, and we're going to get arterial blood gases. Remember, we always get ABGs when we have a patient who's got symptoms of hypoxia. Then we get the chest x-ray. So remember, the chest x-ray is the best initial diagnostic test, but that doesn't mean it's the best initial step in the management of the patient. If the patient, however, is stable, just the fever, cough, and sputum, go ahead and just start with the chest x-ray. So this is really important. The sequence of management is really important for all of the steps especially step three CCS, by the way. Uh, so community-acquired pneumonia is just this general infection of the lung parenchyma. It's the most common cause of pneumonia among everybody, and the most common cause, bacterially, is strep pneumonia. The risk factors are uh, variable. Uh, cigarette smoking is a big one. Splenectomy is another big one. Remember, strep pneumonia is an encapsulated organism, so if you don't have your spleen, you're at higher risk. Um, and then uh, alcohol consumption, as we'll see. Symptoms include that hallmark triad physical exam with community-acquired lobar pneumonia will show rails, ronchi, dullness, egophony, things that you probably learned in M2 and you've forgotten since then. Diagnosis, best initial test is a chest x-ray, shows lobar consolidation, whereas with atypical pneumonias, it'll show these diffuse infiltrates. We already talked about that. You should always, always, always get sputum cultures. The ID docs love those. All right, so get sputum cultures, and then blood cultures can be useful for you too, especially if you have a real sick-looking patient. This is lobar pneumonia here. It can be hard to see, but it's right here. So this is much more obvious. 
and it just generally follows these patterns. So here you see it here. Now, what I've got for you here is three AP x-rays, but you wanna make sure you order AP and lateral chest x-rays. You gotta get both. The treatment is to tend to your ABCs, and then we ask ourselves, who is this patient and what are we gonna do with them? So if they're a generally healthy patient, they're not hypoxic, they're satting fine, then we just give them oral azithromycin and send them home, follow up in a week. If they have comorbidities, let's say they're old, they've got COPD or something like that, um, the question is how sick do they look? And we're gonna see there's, um, there, there are some sort of algorithms, uh, point systems that can help us decide whether we need to admit the patient or not. If they do have comorbidities, we'll give them azithromycin and amoxicillin clavulanate, so both. If they are impatient, um, so I don't mean impatient like they wanna get out of there, but if they're, we need to treat them impatient because they've got um, concerning signs, um, then we're gonna give them azithromycin and ceftriaxone, or you can do fluoroquinolone monotherapy, but I would go with this. If they need to be in the ICU, same thing, okay? It's just the same treatment. Now, if the patient has a history of pseudomonas, you need to cover for that. So especially here if you're dealing with a cystic fibrosis patient. So what we're going to do here is we're gonna, uh, these patients will obviously be admitted. Instead of giving ceftriaxone, we'll give one of these anti-pseudomonal drugs. You should know your anti-pseudomonal drugs. Miram, Piptaz, Cefepime, those are all good options. If we're concerned about MRSA, uh, then you will add vancomycin or linazolid in addition to azithromycin and ceftriaxone or azithromycin and mirapenem or piptaz or cefepime if we're considering uh, pseudomonas alongside it. Daptomycin is always the wrong answer. Why? Because surfactant will neutralize, will... Uh, Neutralize, that's the best word. It'll neutralize daptomycin. So it won't be effective for pneumonia. It can be effective for other infections, but it's not effective for pneumonia. This is an algorithm that you can use. Uh, I got this from AMBOSS, so this is not my work here. Um, now, we have to determine whether the patient needs to be admitted. So this is just sort of how I go about it, but you can use that CURB 65 or PSI score if you want. Um, generally, I admit them if they're over 65, if they uh, are hypoxic without supplemental oxygen, meaning they need supplemental oxygen to sat properly, or if they're hypotensive despite fluids, that points to a possible sepsis. So these patients should be admitted. When do we admit them to the ICU? Well, if we're giving them supplemental oxygen, we're giving it and we're giving it and we're giving it and we still can't get them saturated properly. That's one situation. Or if they're hypotensive despite fluids. These are very, very sick people. They need to go to the ICU. Supportive care, we always do. You can see what it is here. And we base our progress uh, on symptom resolution and radiography. So these patients will get serial chest x-rays if they're admitted. Now, hospital-acquired pneumonia is pneumonia that develops in a patient that's been hospitalized for more than a couple days. They start to develop symptoms. Again, we kind of go about working this up the same way. Sputum cultures are really important. We always need to treat these patients with coverage for pseudomonas and MRSA. So we're gonna use an anti-pseudomonal drug like Miram. We're gonna use an anti-MRSA drug like vancomycin. And then you'll use a respiratory fluoroquinolone or aminoglycoside. So all three of these. Okay, acute bronchitis is infection and inflammation of the bronchi, primarily of the upper airways. The hallmark symptoms will be present, but the cough will be the most salient. They're, they're gonna have a really, really bad cough. Now, acute versus chronic bronchitis, what's the difference? Remember, chronic bronchitis is part of COPD and it's seen in patients with certain risk factors. Acute bronchitis will often happen in healthy people. Chest x-ray is the best initial test, but it's gonna be normal. So acute bronchitis will have a normal chest x-ray and we don't do anything for it, okay? We don't do anything for it. It's just supportive therapy. Make sure they're hydrated. Um, if they have a fever, you can give them Tylenol, uh, but there's no antibiotic treatment necessary here. Now, chronic bronchitis in the setting of COPD exacerbation, 
we go about this a little bit differently. So again, we get a chest x-ray, we're looking for pneumonia, and we exclude that because it's normal. Make sure and get the sputum culture, the gram stains, routine labs, ABG, that's all useful to you. Now, how we treat this is, again, differently. Um, with mild exacerbations, we can just give amoxicillin, that is fine. Uh, however, if this is a COPD or who's had a recent, oh, actually not recent, uh, if they've had any sputum culture that showed pseudomonas, then you need to cover for pseudomonas and use one of those pseudomonas drugs. Alongside this, we're going to give them medication to handle their COPD because these are usually exacerbations. These patients are going to be short of breath. Uh, so you give a short-acting beta agonist and systemic corticosteroids. A pulmonary abscess is a focal contained circumscribed infection of the lung parenchyma. This is usually anaerobes. So the risk factors here are alcoholism, aspiration, loss of consciousness, especially seizures, anything where you could aspirate. The symptoms here, again, hallmark, fever, sputum, and cough. The sputum will often be putrid. It stinks because of the anaerobes. Anaerobes stink. Uh, you can hear amphoric breath sounds, uh, and the fever will generally be higher than it would be in a pneumonia. Chest x-ray is the best initial test. You'll see focal cavitation with an air fluid level. Make sure and get the sputum and blood cultures before starting antibiotics. The treatment here, the best, uh, the, the best treatment is ampicillin sulbactam. Uh, there are other drugs, and you know that goes with any of these infections. There's always alternatives. I'm just giving you the most common drugs that are used at least in my experience. Drainage is rarely needed for a pulmonary abscess. The most accurate test is biopsy. We don't do it, but it is technically the most accurate. So here's a pulmonary abscess. So you can see, again, this cavitating lesion here, and then this dark black arrow is pointing to the air fluid level. So again, you see the cavitating lesion here, kind of hard to discern an air fluid level, maybe here, it's kind of hard to tell. And I, yeah, I think that's the only one. Uh, here you see, it. obviously, this is a child. Uh, you can tell by the ribs, the way they're shaped. Um, so here, again, we see the abscess. These are all the causes of atypical pneumonia. I am certainly not going into all of these. You can see why. So some of the different causes of atypical pneumonia that could come up, mycoplasma pneumonia, this is gonna be a young person with just some real mild symptoms, maybe they're protracted. And then you think, okay, it might be pneumonia. You get a chest x-ray and it's like, whoa, what is going on here? You've got a very, very, very striking chest x-ray with diffuse interstitial markings, and it is totally out of proportion to the symptoms. These patients usually come in and they're like, well, I got a little bit of a cough, maybe a little low-grade fever. You get that chest x-ray and it's wild. Um, so again, these are young patients. The diagnosis is a cold agglutinin assay. However, you can often diagnose this clinically with the chest x-ray and their presentation. The treatment is a macrolide. We usually go with azithromycin. Legionnaire's disease, expect in older adults with pulmonary symptoms and GI symptoms. So these patients will often get nausea and diarrhea. That stands out. And they can also get some neurosymptoms. Uh, hyponatremia is another big one. So if you're suspecting Legionnaire's disease, make sure and get your electrolytes because that will give you a big hint. These tend to occur in outbreaks, so this is a reportable disease. Make sure if you're taking CCS that this is reported to the State Department of Health. The diagnosis is with a Legionella urine antigen. The best initial step is, of course, the chest x-ray, but to diagnose this, we get that urine antigen. Treatment here is doxycycline or a macrolide. COVID-19 infection, we should all be familiar with this at, at this point. Very similar presentation. However, the loss of smell or taste will often be given to you on an exam question. Coxiella pneumonia or Q fever, Coxiella burnettii. Uh, this is going to typically be seen in veterinarians or farmers, association with exposure to sheep or animal placenta. Uh, the diagnosis here is a serology. The treatment is doxycycline. By the way, doxycycline, I always tell my med students this. If you get a question and you know that it's probably from an animal source or a tick source, Doxycycline is probably the right answer. If you don't know, just go with doxycycline. Coccidioidomycosis is also known as San Joaquin fever or valley fever. It occurs in the U.S. Southwest, especially after earthquakes, which dislodge the fungus from the ground. 
Uh, these patients will often have a faint kind of strawberry colored maculopapular rash. They can have arthralgias. The diagnosis here is serology. Exam's always gonna tell you they come from the Southwest. They've got this rash in addition to pneumonia. We give antifungals for this, namely fluconazole. Pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia, also called, also called PCP pneumonia, based on the old name, pneumocystis carini, is going to be an AIDS patient. These patients are very hypoxic. So you've got a patient coming in with hypoxia, a history of HIV AIDS, um, then you need to think PCP. Uh, we're going to get bronchoalveolar lavage. That's the best test for, for pneumocystis gyrovecchi. The treatment here is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, or if they're allergic to sulfa, like I am, uh, you go with pentamidine. Group B strep pneumonia is in neonates. Look for a history of a mom who has GBS infection or did not get tested, vaginal delivery. These babies are going to have neutropenia. Babies show up a little differently when they're infected. They can also have hypothermia instead of fever. The treatment here is ampicillin and gentamicin. Klebsiella pneumonia, this is aspiration, current jelly sputum, usually alcoholics. They're probably not going to tell you current jelly sputum on the exam. They might tell you it's red and jello-y and uh, I don't know. There's a lot of ways they can tell you. But if it sounds like current jelly, Google it. Um, then it's probably Klebsiella. We treat this with any third generation cephalosporin. Ceftriaxone is probably the most common. So here's a cheat sheet for you, and uh, you can print this out if you want. It covers everything we went over. So here's how atypical pneumonia looks like on chest x-ray. You can imagine if you have a young person coming in, oh doc, I just have a little bit of a cough and kind of a fever and I don't really feel good, but you know, I was on the sort of, uh, I don't know if I wanted to come in, but I figure I should get checked out. You get a chest x-ray and you see this, you've got walking pneumonia, mycoplasma. So this is exactly what it looks like here. And I'm showing you chest x-rays because this is super common. I think I've had this three or four times in my life. So it's common. The pneumococcal vaccine could come up, particularly on step three, who should be vaccinated, anyone who requests it, prison inmates, uh, possibly military recruits, and then all of these conditions, you can see there's a lot of people. Um, so if they request it, certainly if they're over 65, if they've had a spleen removed, if they got COPD, you need to uh, vaccinate these patients. There are multiple different pneumococcal vaccines. You can look more into that if you want. This is the CURB-65 scoring system. Uh, this has largely been, suppl su been supplanted by the PSI, the Pneumonia Severity Index. Uh, but this is a good way to remember it for your exam uh, because it is sufficient. Uh, however, we've largely moved on to this PSI system. You're not going to need to memorize this. There's so much here. Uh, but you can see here how we can use this to guide whether we admit the patient or not. And that's primarily how these systems are used.